It's time for the Soteriology 101 podcast, where God is most glorified by his love and provision for all people. Welcome your host, the Director of Apologetics for Texas Baptists, an adjunct professor of theology and a local teaching pastor, Dr. Leighton Flowers. Welcome to Soteriology 101. Today I have a guest with me that I am honored to have on the program. Uh, He has been a hero of the faith from a distance uh, to me just simply because he's been the author of the traditional statement as well as someone who has uh, influenced me in his writings over the years. And so I finally uh, cornered him at the uh, 316 banquet this last year and asked if he would come onto the program. Um, This is Dr. Eric Hankins. He is the uh, senior pastor at Fairhope. He came from First Baptist Church of Oxford, Mississippi, where he was the pastor for 12 years. Um, He has his uh, MDiv from New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary and his Ph.D. from Southwestern. And welcome to the to program, uh, Dr. Hankins. Glad to be here. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule. I know pastors um, have to uh, carve out time for things like this, and so I really appreciate you doing this. And I also want to personally thank you for your work in this field. I know that's no small task when you, uh, when you are uh, on a busy schedule to take the time to to engage in a theological discussion and dispute within uh, the Southern Baptist Convention. And so I just wanted to personally thank you for that and ask you, you know, just maybe tell us a little bit just background on what led into this and why you decided to take a stand on this particular issue. Yes, um, probably around 2010 is when I really began to engage the issue of soteriology specifically, uh, mainly driven by an interaction with a, a layman in my church who really um, began to challenge me on my not being a Calvinist. Right. <laughs> and my standard replies didn't seem to be getting much traction. He was pretty informed, you know, mm-hmm. certainly for a layman. And uh, so I started to dig deeply. I was I would have characterized myself uh, uh, as a three point Calvinist uh, at right. the time, which is a not a good way, by the way, to to, to think about this whole discussion. So I'm, right. I'm I'm done, and I would encourage others to abandon that that way of thinking uh, about their own soteriology. And so uh, I started really taking a look at Calvinism and came to discover that I wasn't a Calvinist, had never been a Calvinist, didn't agree with really anything about Calvinism, and uh, that it actually uh, caused me some great concerns. Uh, and so um, uh, because of the, the increase that I was noticing in tension over the issue, uh, the uh, criticisms that uh, my peers were, uh, were uh, encountering in their churches, uh, from Calvinists, um, hearing stories of churches splitting over it, and uh, and then just this sense of, of being made to feel like my soteriological views and, and those of my heroes, Adrian Rogers, Jerry Vines, Paige Patterson, men like that, were that, that they were the ones who were deficient and that even the problems with the SBC were related to our soteriology. For all of those reasons, I felt like it was time for uh, someone to stand up and say, yeah, I have a huge problem with that, and right. um, um, we need to speak up and, and, and maybe even do something about it. One of the things I know I get a lot of critique on for doing this podcast, which is specifically geared towards soteriology, and in, in, especially within the Southern Baptist Convention, and my own upbringing, having come into Calvinism and then back out of it some you know 10 years later, um, and because I created this podcast to address these particular issues, some view me as being divisive or... Uh, You know, Leighton, if you just don't talk about it, then there won't be a divide here. Or, you know, if by talking about it, you're being divisive. Um, I know you have, based upon our conversations, you've experienced a lot of the same things. Because by writing this traditional statement, you're you're trying to divide the Southern Baptist Convention. How do you respond to those who bring that kind of charge? Uh, It's just a it's just a that's just a smokescreen. Of course, theology is divisive. It's, yeah. That's the nature of theology. It's having convictions, uh, making truth claims, and, and, and lining up warrants and having arguments. That's why we have theology. And so um, I, to, to the charge of divisiveness, I would just say, agreed. 
uh, it's uh, th- these are two very very different opinions. I think the problem with the with the debate is we've been pretending like these disagreements aren't real or these disagreements mm-hmm. aren't substantial. These are second order. Or these aren't these aren't you know primary uh, uh, areas of disagreement. And um, I, I've come to believe that we we have incompatible views of soteriology. I mean, I, I don't know how else to put it. And the truth is, the Calvinists know it. Uh, they're determinists, and I'm not. Right. And those, the, the the outflow, the soteriological outflow out of those commitments, they just they will never go together. Right. And so we've got a problem. And the the way you solve theological problems is by having debate. Uh, most of the time, debate is sharp. Uh, and uh, these are these are things about which we care deeply. And so I, I'm sort of encouraging. Because I've, I have bought in, or I got, I got. It's easy to get pulled into this idea of, well, you know, we need to be nice to each other, and you know, we agree about more areas uh, than we disagree, and 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 that's true enough. Sure. But uh, but in in these areas of soteriology, we have really deep disagreements, and and so let's 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 work it out, or or let's argue it out, and. Uh, uh, I think that's the only way forward. Mm. Well, you you um, spoke at the 316 conference that we just recently have, the Connect 316 conference, which you can find out more about Connect 316 if you go to connect316.net. Um, and there at the SBC convention in um, Phoenix, uh, you gave a, a very, I think, poignant speech um, and call uh, to loyal opposition. In fact, I have up on the screen that you can't you can't see it because you're on the phone. But um, I have here at SBC today the transcript of that speech. For those who want to see it, you can go to SBC today, and you can read this for yourself verbatim in its uh, entirety. Um, and you really don't mince words. I mean, you pretty much come straight out and and call us to uh, loyal opposition. Explain what you mean. By loyal opposition, how would you frame really the, the crux of the theme of this particular, you know, uh, call to action? Well, I chose loyal opposition. Actually, probably the, the launching point was this charge of, of being divisive, of, of splitting the convention or, or doing something that, that's harmful uh, and not right, uh, mm-hmm. perhaps not even moral. And um, so in searching about a way to communicate uh uh, that what I was doing was actually uh, in the spirit of what it meant to be a Baptist, in the spirit of what it means to do good theology and, and good interaction. I hit up on a, a term out of British Parliament called loyal opposition. The, the party that's not in the majority still has the duty uh, to remain loyal to king and country, to remain loyal to the values. Of this is you know the, the values of the British Empire, and, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but part of that loyalty is expressed in in voicing opposition to uh, the uh, the ruling party when such opposition ought to be voiced, when the ruling party is making heading in the wrong direction, and it's actually good for the country and good for the political process uh, to do that. It's a, it's right. an expression of loyalty, and so rather as traditionalists than being told that we're a problem, we shouldn't be saying anything, what we're doing is wrong. Uh, I, I want to flip that script. What we're doing is right. It's good. Mm-hmm. It ought to be done. Uh, we're going. We're, we're going to insist that we be listened to. Uh, we're going to. Uh, we're going to hopefully be, be making better and better arguments in doing so, uh, because we believe that's good for the kingdom. It's good for Southern Baptists to do that. Uh, it's uh, an expression of our what I want to argue is our tradition, which we've always modified Calvinism. We've always had an appreciation for it, but it, at, at critical spots, it said, "No, we're that. That's not us. Uh, right. that, that, right. that that those things are a bridge too far." And so that was my. That, but that's the main impulse. Is is what as you already uh, addressed with the divisiveness question. It's not the wrong thing to do to raise these issues. It's the right thing to do to raise these issues. Absolutely, I, I think you you made a really strong point um, in in your your speech about how it's important for us to highlight the areas of concern if, if we truly believe that there are biblical issues, if we believe the Bible is relevant and true, um, not just tradition. In other words, a lot of times it seems to me what frustrates me about the term traditionalism is sometimes the focus tends to be back on 
this the concept that hey we're defending this because we believe this is the first view or the most prominent view of Southern Baptist from its very beginning and and really from my understanding of your writings and my own motivation has very little to do with what people believed you know 200 years ago or even you know 2,000 years ago with the exception obviously of what the authors of Scripture actually said that we're really wanting to go back to and appeal to what the Bible actually teaches. And yeah, there you know, may be some value in looking at history and what you know forefathers have said and what they have argued. Being familiar with those arguments is, is always important. But from the crux of everything I've heard you argue, you have argued for going back to the scriptures as our authority, not to councils or to you know creeds. That's right. I, I would say on some level that the that the the um, name tradition traditionalism is a uh, is a little bit unfortunate. Um, the the reason that came about is because uh, Calvinists, especially sort of in the founders' uh, trajectory, were making the case: Hey, we've always been Calvinists, and we kind of goofed it up here over the last couple of generations, and we need to go back to that. So the whole founders thing. And so when I first really started speaking and engaging, what I want to say is, no, it's all we've always not been Calvinists. <laughs> we've always modified it right. uh, because we had problems with it. And so that's that's and and then when I tried other things, like in my, uh, uh, an early article I wrote, I wanted to say, let's go back not Arminianism or Calvinism, but let's go back to a Baptist soteriology. Oh my gosh, the Calvinists just howled, and you're saying we're well, not Baptists, and so that didn't work. So I couldn't find a good term. And then traditionalism sort of sort of uh, took hold. You know, I don't think Calvin really wanted his followers to be called Calvinists. You know, Anabaptism was an insult back in the day. Methodism mm-hmm. was an insult. You know, when it first started going. So, um, but the the name stick, and then it's right. just it, it is what it is. Anyway, yeah. but the, but it does, as you point out, lead to the idea this is about defending a tradition. Uh, right. Lord have mercy. That's. <laughs> that is not <laughs> what this is about, and it's not what it means to be Baptist. And really, it's really not what it means to be Protestant. Right, right. Uh, uh, just because something is a tradition, uh, you should follow it. Although I get tons of that now. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're not being. You're 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 saying Reformed theology is not true. Yes, <laughs> I know. That's the point. Uh, I don't care that it doesn't. That, that what I'm saying doesn't fit with Calvinistic or, or, or norms or, or reform norms. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm a Baptist. I don't want to say what the Bible is saying. Uh, uh, so, uh, a- again, when I say tradition, I mean the good tradition of just wanting to say what the Bible says, just mm-hmm. wanting to say what Paul says, and taking into account the whole counsel of Scripture, and for us specifically, the clear witness that the Bible speaks of God's desire to save all, of Christ's death for the sins of all, and for uh, the, the fact that anyone can be, anyone who hears the gospel can be hmm. saved. Well, I, I just pulled That's up... What the Bible says. I, amen. I, I just pulled up on the screen, in fact, while you were saying that, um, a quote from the, the presentation there at Connect 316, um, and Rick Patrick um, posted this at the uh, the roundtable, 316 roundtable on Facebook. And he just highlighted four or five of the key quotes from your presentation that I wanted to highlight here as well for our audience and then get your commentary a little bit further on them. Uh, this particular one was pretty much reiterating what you were just now saying, that, quote, Calvinism suffers from massive exegetical, theological, and philosophical problems that translate into massive problems in faith and practice. Calvinism impugns the character of God. It makes nonsense of the biblical assertions that God loves everyone, that Christ died for the sins of everyone, and that anyone can be saved. It obliterates any concept of the well-meant offer of the gospel. It offers no answer to the problem of evil except that God is the cause. It offers either soft-headed incoherence or cold-hearted coherence. That's a pretty bold statement. Um, and when you, when you, especially when you make the point, what really stood out to me in that point is something that, you know, really when I was listening to Rabbi Zacharias earlier in the week, or probably early in the month, I guess it was, and his defense of the concept of the problem of evil, um, and he was offering the commonly known free will defense. Um, where does evil originate? In the free actions of creatures, in the free will of man, defining free will in a libertarianly way, in a libertarian way, that it's the ability to choose one way or the other, to refrain or not refrain from given moral actions, that the origin of evil comes from 
the creature, not the creator. Um, in your estimation, in, in your studies, how have Calvinists combated this charge when, you, when you've made the charge that ultimately God has to be, logically speaking, the cause of evil within the deterministic framework? Yes, they are. They consistently respond, uh, and it's you. And, and oh, I know the quote you just read. That's absolutely apoplectic. Oh, they howl and mischaracterization. And oh my gosh, it's just you just wouldn't believe it. You know, we we are no, just killing it. them. <laughs> um, but it's always an appeal to that which is logically contradictory. I mean, that's that's it. Uh, God's the cause of everything, and He's not the cause of evil. Uh, God uh, uh, has a will to save, and he doesn't have a will to save. Uh, God meticulously foreordains everything, and then he doesn't meticulously foreordain everything. I mean, we, I've gone round and round and round and round and round. And when you push them, then they'll say, well, the Bible affirms the, those things. So the Bible's logically contradictory. No, but I'm just telling you, listeners out there understand this. They just say that which is logically contradictory must be affirmed. And that's how they get there. And I, I... That's how we stay together, and that's how we're friends, is we just sort of choose to let them be logically contradictory. And, and we love the part of the contradiction that we agree with. That God, you know, they're, Well, they're over here saying that they believe that God loves everybody. Great. You know, that's great. Me too. But I know they also believe that, that at the same time, he doesn't love everyone, scientifically. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think for, for a lot of years, we just sort of kind of allowed it. And then I think what they do in their mind is they say, well, we all know that they're really semi-Pelagians. You know, Hankins is really a semi-Pelagian. But, but they sort of let me, since I say I'm not, but I really am, then we'll just sort of ignore, you know, what we really believe about the other person. Mm-hmm. The, the, and that, that probably was a sufficient sort of detente uh, for some time. But when the Calvinists really started hammering away, and this is founders, this is – this is nettles and those guys that you know that's a problem and it's, it's weakened our theology and and you know uh, guys like Adrian Rogers or, or you know the opposition in high places is what nettles called it in his book I mean they start they start making their argument mm-hmm. that we're a problem okay well then let's have the debate uh, because the truth is y'all have a huge problem uh, uh, it's huge internally, it's huge philosophically, it's huge exegetically, it's huge historically. And so now we're going to have the debate. And it's it, it, and here's where I'm going with all that. And their debate point rests on the affirmation of that which is logically contradictory. That's how they do it. Mm-hmm. Now, they call it a mystery, they call it tension, and we don't understand how this is. The Bible affirms both, but it's just, they just reshuffle uh, and re-argue the same basic point. Mm-hmm. Uh, we affirm that, which is logically contradictory. Right. Well, and I, I know that my listeners have heard the explanation from my vantage point of the charge of Pelagianism or even semi-Pelagianism, but I, I wanted to hear directly from you, um, and a lot of what I said I know is very much close to what you've said because a lot of what I've said has come from me reading some of what you've said. But I wanted to hear from, from directly from you how you respond to Calvinists who say, Dr. Hankins, man, you, you've fallen off into the ditch of a heresy, or at least a semi-heresy, um, semi-Pelagianism, and it said with such you know concern of, oh my goodness, how, how could you possibly hold to this horribly bad thing called Pelagianism um, when we all know and, and just you know, this is just a horrible thing you've got to avoid at all costs, of course. How, how, do you, how do you answer someone who begins to throw out that terminology? Because it, it seems to me that even those on our side of the theological fence, so to speak, are so concerned about that label that they will dance around and, and, and almost like walking on eggshells around Calvinists so as to avoid this charge. Um, and and I, I just wonder, what's behind this, and how do you respond to those bringing that charge against the traditional statement? Well, I know this is going to sound harsh, but it's just it's sophistry. It's just a scare tactic. It's a ooh, semi-Pelagian. That's a scary word, and nobody really knows what it means. And, and certainly, you know, rank and file Southern Baptist, but it sounds bad, you yeah. know. So, that, ooh, you know, we don't want anybody saying that about us. I say, no, number one. Um, what other parts of the Councils of Orange 
of what the Council of Orange affirms uh, are we supposed to ascribe to? Um, right. Baptismal regeneration, of infants, uh, infant yeah. baptism, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, on and on and on and on. Right. So I don't care uh, what they said at that council. No, number two, and this this follows from it. It's a late medieval argument about a a sixth century theological debate between Augustine and Pelagius that has all sorts of philosophical arms and legs and assumptions. Uh, that aren't what anybody really thinks about how the world works anymore, and, and on and on and on and on and on. It's, it's just it's just hopelessly mired. It, it's it's fun to talk about if you're a historical theologian or if you mm. care about you know medieval uh, um, philosophy, the Via Moderna and and, and nominalism and William uh, 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 of Ockham and uh, and you know. On and on, that kind of thing. It's 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 an interesting historical discussion, but it has no bearing on the present discussion. Right. So what I tend to say is 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 just eh, <laughs> you know, not interested in that. You're, you're going to have to make real arguments, not fake arguments. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it's interesting how and, how Calvinists so often when you're in conversations with them, they'll say, "Well, let's go back to the Bible. The Bible's the authority. Let's talk about Scripture." Um, but whenever you start to push on the biblical arguments with regard, especially with the concept of this this assumed total inability from birth argument, then you start pushing on that, and then immediately they go to the label of semi-Pelagianism or Pelagianism to silence the That's discussion. Right. Like, right. Okay, wait, time out. You, you say you want to go to Scripture, but then when I start going to Scripture to point out the absence of anything remotely having to do with our abi- a loss of ability from birth due to um, this decree of God uh, from the fall of Adam— Okay, let's go to the scripture for that, and then and instead they want to appeal to a fifth century council and call me and label me a Pelagian or a semi-Pelagian, That's so right. as to stop the discussion. Yeah, yeah. The, the the one of the within days of publishing the traditional statement, you know, the, the, here, here come the responses, and it's and, and it was it was uh, the the biggest criticism is Article Two about the nature of man and that kind of thing. And Al Mohler's quote money quote was um, it's apparently semi-Pelagian. So that's that's the bam. That's the this apparently semi-Pelagian. What I want to hear is it's, it's apparently uh, contradicting what Paul says in Romans. Blah, 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 blah. I, I, I want to hear a chapter and a verse out of the Bible. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, can't amen. Find it. No, it's can't not. Find yeah, it, 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 it doesn't, don't, it doesn't don't exist. Don't give me orange. Give me Paul. Yeah. <laughs> and, and look, and if you if you put some Paul on me and it's black letter, then, then I got to concede the field. Right. You know, because yep. goodness knows, do you think I want to be a heretic? Do you yeah. think I want to, <laughs> uh, would ever want to dishonor the Lord and, and, and not believing right about him or, or cause others to stumble or cause people to miss salvation? Man, I'm, I, I'm, it's, 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 I'm always open to being uh, reformed and corrected and, and that sort of thing, but I'm, I'm still waiting. <laughs> well, know, and that, that really for, goes right into the, this next quote, too. Because um, Patrick uh, labeled this quote the changing of the grid, because I, I think this is a really important aspect of it, because even Roger Olson and other Arminians titled or even kind of went along with this semi-Pelagian thing, because they're all on that same theological grid that ultimately puts anything that gives the gospel actual power um, that actually says the message of God's truth is sufficient to do what it actually says it's supposed to do, which is so that all may believe, um, that, that that somehow has is a semi-heretical view, which just baffles me because e- either we're born by the creation of God with this capacity to respond to him, or God, supernatural through some provenient work, gives us that ability at some time later. Either way, it's still of God. I mean, it's either God created it in us as the Imago Dei, and we didn't lose it because of the fall, as some people assume, or he gave it to us at some later point. Either way, we're, we're not, it's not like we're out there saying, okay, we went out to our, our tool shed and we built ourselves this this ability to freely respond to God. Uh, obviously, either, either side is saying God gave us this ability, either by creating it within us, or he gave it to us, you know, sometimes after the fall. Why, why would one be considered heretical and one, you know, orthodox or normal? It just, it's, it's, it's strange to me when you really back away from the grid that has kind of been imposed upon the Bible over the centuries, which has caused all of this <laughs> theological debate and, and distraction, I think, 
Um, when you just take it off of the grid, it just seems so much more clear and just straightforward and simple from what you've presented as here's here's the message of salvation. It's calling us to repentance. It's your responsibility. You either repent or you don't. And, and it's really that simple, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and my response to that is all of that, you know, even the response of Arminians like Roger Olson, and he, because his charge, again, was semi-Pelagian. It wasn't, hey, Hank, it's here, you know, here's, you know, here's, Here's a verse from Romans. Here's here's a passage. From, I mean, you just you just can't do that. Right. Okay. But his, I still get we this this late medieval early Renaissance, you know, sort sort of argumentation, which is interesting. I suppose I'm I'm a my PhD is in systematic theology. It's not that I'm not interested in that, but I I I, I, I want to talk about the Bible, what the mm-hmm. Bible says, and I and this is not. Uh, me being um, disingenuous about the issue of hermeneutics and the fact that we all bring presuppositions to the text, I know that, and I think it's important to it's important to to understand that that, that that's precisely my point. Uh, they are using a, a a late medieval hermeneutical grid to do the exegetical work, that, that it, and it doesn't work. Uh, and so I, I want to get out of that grid, off of that right. hermeneutic, and, and see if we can't find, a, you know, a, a more reliable uh, approach. But uh, uh, but it still is getting back to the Bible, right? Uh, and, and what the Bible says and doesn't say. Absolutely. Well, and and, and to be clear, none of us are, are trying to to say that man, that sin hasn't affected mankind. We all we all affirm the, that the fall has affected mankind. That we we are sinners that we have, uh, because we sin, we have guilt and condemnation. Uh, we're all saying that, that without God's initiative in the work of the gospel, the, the Holy Spirit bringing conviction through his word, um, through his revelation, through his truth, without that, we would all be hopelessly lost. And so um, the things that oftentimes seems to be being accused uh, towards us um, seem to be taking a really low view of the the actual truth of the message of God's word, the actual words that he inspired. Because it seems to me that if we understand the Bible and the words of God to be gracious, um, to be spirit wrought, uh, brought to us by the Holy Spirit, then all of the things that even our Arminian brothers and some of our Calvinistic brothers are demanding that we, we say must come before faith, we're actually saying do come before faith because we actually think the gospel is a Holy Spirit gracious truth brought to bring conviction to the world, brought to, uh, to, to help us to, to see and to know and thus to believe. Um, and therefore, we can say, I think very confidently, that, n- yeah, we, we need a pervenient work in the sense that we need the work of the gospel. We need what the Bible says we need, which is his word, his truth, his light, the very word that we'll be judged by. And so it just seems to me that, that the grids themselves have, have imposed upon the scriptures this expectation for us to be able to find something that just doesn't exist there, and that, that, that somehow the fall has caused all of humanity to become incapable of responding even to God himself calling us to be reconciled from that fall. And, and it's, just, it's just strange to try to even find, wh- where are they finding this in the text of Scripture? Where, where is this coming from? In your estimation, Besides the appealing to orange, semi-Pelagianism, and those kinds of things, um, where else have you seen Calvinists go to try to defend this grid, this concept of mankind losing the the concept of freedom of the will, the ability to respond even to God Himself? Yeah, there, it's just a it's the it's the heart of Augustinianism. It's the heart of of Luther and, and Calvin's development of those ideas, and so it, it, that's the, the parameters for that debate. Um, and I think it's a it's an incorrect extrapolation of of the scriptures on on that point. But that's that's where the appeal is made. Well, Augustine said, da, 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 da. Well, I, I, you know, I, I think he said many good things. I think, so you think I think he said many not good things. <laughs> And he's not an ultimate authority, and so still want to have a discussion about the text, mm-hmm. and 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 what I get is an appeal to 
to tradition. Right. Well, and until, and I feel the same way, I've had some conversations with Calvinists who pull out vague passages that, that don't speak about any kind of inability um, to respond to the Word of God. It may speak about the inability to submit to the law of God or to fulfill the, the demands of the law, um, but no passages that talk about, or even slavery to sin. That's one back and forth I've had on my blog with a, a, a fellow Calvinistic brother who talked about how, well, we're slaves to sin, slaves to sin, which, of course, he interprets to mean we're also right. incapable of admitting right. our slavery to sin. Right, and so that's what I would say. Does the Bible say we're slaves to sin? Yes. Yeah. And is Amen. slavery to sin bad? It's It's awful. horrible, it's, yeah. So just, you know, look around, okay? But what what does it mean to be a slave to sin? Well, we need to have that exegetical discussion. What did Paul mean when Amen. he spoke of what it meant to be a, a slave to sin? And you can have that discussion. Just don't. And, and you can have a discussion about uh, about an exegetical tradition. I, I, I think it's very important because it's, right. that's, we, we, we stand on the shoulders of giants. But it's not an absolute appeal. Well, since Augustine thought this, then well, that settles the question. Or since Calvin thought this, that settles the question. It doesn't settle the question. Hmm. It, it raises some questions. And then, and then what we have to say is, well, we need, to, we need to figure out whether or not Augustine or Calvin or Luther, whoever, is right about that. Right, and 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 it appears to me, and and a lot of others, that uh, at some critical places they weren't right. It's a good try, mm-hmm. it's better than what, what had gone before them, but they just swung and missed. Right, and so and and we're not, and, and thankfully because we're Baptists, we are not, we're not trapped by those, uh, those interpretations. Right, or bound to those interpretations. Well, right, yeah. It's not like it's not like God inspired, you know, in the 1600s, the you know these leaders of the Reformation to be, you know, more inspired than you and I would be, or something of that nature. Obviously, uh, or, or the, the, certainly the, more than the scriptures. Uh, right, exactly. Where, where you know, we have just as much um, authority as Luther does to interpret the actual scriptures, to go back to the actual words, and we all know that Luther and Calvin, as long along with us and everyone else in between, have their faults and have their false uh, premises and their, uh, their concepts and worldviews that are going to influence the way they read the text. And so um, I, I think the heart of the Reformation is to go back to the authority of the Scripture versus um, sure. you know, the, the, yeah. the councils of you know, Trent or you know, the Council of Dort, or, you know, Court, Dort Council or the whatever council. I mean, that, that's the whole point of the Reformation was, hey, we're not relying upon what the Church tells us to, uh, to do. We're relying upon the Scriptures themselves to go back to the Word of God. And that's what we're saying. That's what we want to do. Um, I, I think that's what you hear from from your presentation, that let's go back to the Word. Let's have this discussion. What does it mean to be a slave to sin? The, the analogy I used is an alcoholic can be absolutely a slave to alcoholism. He's, he's enslaved. He can't stop. He's tried, and he's tried, he's tried. He can't stop drinking alcohol. So his whole family has an intervention. And his daughter's weeping in front of him, and he, he, won't, he won't admit it. No, I'm not addicted. I'm fine. I can stop any time. And, and finally, after hours of confronting this man and his addiction, he finally breaks down. He cries, and he says, okay, you're right. I'm addicted. And he checks himself into a rehab facility. So, okay, so both are true. He it was addicted to, sin, to, to alcohol. But it was also true that he was able to humble himself and submit to treatment. Um, in the same way, we are sinaholics. We are addicted to sin. We are slaves to sin. But there's nothing about slavery that has ever indicated that you're in, you're incapable, morally speaking, of admitting that you're enslaved and accepting the help when it's freely offered, especially when it's offered by God Himself. He's intervening. It's not just a it's not just a family intervening. God, by His Holy Spirit inspired Word, is intervening in our lives. How in the world is that not sufficient to allow for a free response? And it, again, it, the more I talk about it, the more baffled I am that this these grids have been placed over the Bible for so long have caused so many otherwise smart and well-intending people to simply miss it, it seems. Am I, am I overlooking yeah. something there? Or I know no, you and I agree no, on this point. but Right, and, and I think we're back to, uh, and it, we're back to this, the, the, where, where things always return is, well, that, but that's, gosh, that's not the way Martin Luther would have put it. <laughs> well... So, you know, he's a, you know, and I'm thankful for Martin Luther, you yeah. know, hooray, but I'm going to need more than Martin Luther wouldn't have put it that way. 
mm-hmm. um, uh, because the, there are lots of problems that I can point to with the way Martin Luther put it. And so we're going to have to we're going to have to sort of rehab these conversations, right? Be- because for Martin Luther to get where he got, he had he had to he had to utilize Augustine's determinism to do it. And I'm just I'm not willing to go there. It just right. gives the game away. Um, I, I wanted to, to present another a quote from your presentation. Um, uh, again, Rick Patrick pointed this one out, and he, he titles it, how, how Not to Fight a Negative with a Neutral. And, uh, and you said this. You said, we are in the driver's seat. We, traditionalists, are in the driver's seat in terms of theological scholarship. And we need to start acting like it, speaking like it, and writing like it. Positively, we need to develop our sociological convictions into a coherent system that is no longer beholden to the mistakes of Augustian Calvinistic thesis. Negatively, we must demand that Southern Baptist Calvinists own their system. No more punting to paradox. No more appealing to mystery. No more reformed rhetoric and linguistic disingenuity. No more whining about misrepresentation. It's time for Southern Baptist Calvinism to give straight answers to hard questions. And a loyal and vocal engagement of these issues must be pressed. On Calvinist principles, God could have foreordained the salvation of all just as easily and just as righteously, that's the key point there, and just as righteously as he foreordained the salvation of only some. What else can such an act be called except evil? This is not a misrepresentation of Calvinism. I see no, uh, no way around this implication. If there is one, Southern Baptists are going to need to hear it. Um, what, this is something Jerry Walls, I know, points out as well. Yeah, is I, that, I, I essentially stole that from Walls. <laughs> well, l- let's unpack that. I, I, in fact, I, I, yeah, yeah. I want to unpack that further because ultimately the point is, and let me restate it and you and you help me here to make sure I'm, I'm on the right track here. Ultimately what he's saying is because God can regenerate everyone and thus cause them to want to come, because from our perspective right. the, the reason not everyone's saved is because he has allowed for the freedom of the will to either accept or reject, and so it makes sense Correct. that he's not going right. to force somebody to go to heaven who's rejected his, his offer. And so that makes sense from our worldview. But from the Calvinistic worldview, he can righteously change the will of a person to make them want to come, and yet he doesn't. It's almost like a fireman who goes into a building that he started on fire, by the way, and he has the ability to grab everybody out of the building and pull them out, but he chooses to only grab a select few. Um, And and it does so to demonstrate, I guess, his his power in starting the fire in the first place. Again, What's behind this? How do Calvinists answer this charge? Because it seems to me very damning to Calvinism. Right, and so it is. And so far, the responses I get are things like two wills, or or even with Piper, I think it's three wills in God, and, and you know, hidden will and revealed will, and just all it, it's it's those are all rear guard actions. Those are all it's 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 not. They're, they're shims being shoved into the system to make it work. They're, they're not. Uh, um, they're not uh, positive statements so much as they are hasty defenses of the, of the problems of determinism. And so, what I'm asking for, I think, what I'm really asking for, because I don't think they can. They, the, so far, and they've had like you know hundreds of years to to, to come up with it, and they, they haven't. Right. Is I think what I'm asking for is them to say, well, we admit it's logically contradictory, uh, but you know, it just, it just there are some things that are logically contradictory. <laughs> you know, well, I, I think that's their only the only thing they can say is uh, that. Now, the, the, obviously, the problem with that admission is it's a it's a massive philosophical problem because if if logical contradictions can exist, then knowledge itself collapses. Right. You know? Right. Um, uh, but that's the that's what they're stuck with, right? Um, and and they uh, and if I were a Calvinist, I, that's what I would do is I would just continue to you know to kind of just sort of come up with these fixes. But I think it's the thing that drives people out of Calvinism most consistently is once they realize oh these are all just reshuffling the same 
uh, attempt to defend the logical contradiction, the, that which is logically contradictory, and I can no longer, you know, affirm right. that which is logically contradictory. Well, and I, and I think in one of your responses, um, you even said all this effort um, going into supporting and propping up something nobody should want to believe, <laughs> that, that ultimately <laughs> right. that God has foreordained the damnation of most people. Um, again, it, it's almost like once you've, uh, you, once you've adhered to a particular philosophical worldview and theological worldview, and you've especially become known by that. I know as a Calvinist for the longest time, even towards the end of my adherence to Calvinism, there was a part of me that just almost said, ah, I see, I see the naked emperor, so to speak, as I've put it in my article. Yeah. I see, I see that it, it's got some issues, but man, that, I'm, I'm not, I, I split my home church, helps to split my home church over this issue, by golly. Um, I'm known, um, I mean, when I was given the opportunity to read in my theology class um, at Hardin-Simmons, a, any chapter of the Bible for our public reading. I chose Romans nine by golly, because I was yeah, a hardline right, right. Calvinist and I wanted, and I was known for that. And that, therefore there was a part of me that just almost fought off even thinking about some of those contradictions because I knew the pat answers and I, and I knew so many really smart people who held to the same view that I was holding to. So I could, I could kind of push down those, those things that were rising up within me going, ah, man, that is really hard to swallow. Um, and when, when you really begin to start pushing Calvinists to think beyond their normal pat answers and to say, okay, are, we, are you really beholden to the systematic that you hold to? Like they accuse us to being, hey, you're just trying to you know, defend your tradition. Could it be that you're just trying to defend your systematic tradition as well and, and not willing to really engage with the problems of the very thing that you're holding to and, and that you're defending something that really – by the very basis of it, it's just almost indefensible when you really begin to unpack it and take it for what it really is. Yeah, I, and I, there's a, uh, a a book I've, I've liked for a, a long time and, and, and sort of reread over and over again. It's Thomas Kuhn's um, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, and it's really talking about scientific revolutions, but it can be uh, applied to uh, revolutions that need to occur in, in any area of, of thinking, including theology. And so I think what's going on with, with Calvinists is um, they're, they're committed to this system, and, and if they give away, if they, or if they cop to the fact that it's a, it's a logical contradictory, the whole system collapses, and, and they, have to, they have to abandon it. And they've invested their lives and ministries, as, as you mentioned, they've made decisions, they've, you know, and they have a history of it helping them and helping other people and, and having some benefits for affirmations of God's sovereignty and, and you know, the seriousness of sin. It's not that, that, that Calvinism is all bad or even mostly bad. It's, you know, I'm, I have an appreciation for, for uh uh, some of the things that John Piper writes and, and that sort of thing, but but if if you go where I'm going, you you have to abandon Calvinism. It's, there, there's nothing left because the center of Calvinism is God's sovereignty. That's the that's what they believe is at the center of their theological project. Yeah. And I think every good theological system has a center like that. For for Arminians, it's the love of God. Right. Um, well, and, and, and even so, it's a sovereignty and, that's defined as control. Not yes. As, yes. Yeah. So let me. Yes. Yeah, so, right. so sovereignty meaning God meticulously foreordains the salvation of some and right. not all. That's 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 at the top. You know, of the Westminster Confession. That's that's where they lead in. Since God chooses some and not others, based solely on His decree. Da 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 da. da. You know, the rest right. of the uh, of the of the theology flows out of that. But right. if it so happens that God doesn't do that. And I think it's it's clear to me that he doesn't. Uh, then the system goes away, yep. and that's that's a that's a massive concession to have to make. Hmm. Um, and I and I understand why people don't want to do it. Hmm. Um, the another uh, point uh, he he calls it the money quote. Um, which is obviously pointing to a, the quote that really gets to the heart of the, the charge that you bring. Uh, Dr. Patrick um, quotes you uh, here, and uh, he says, in keeping faith, or you, you are saying this, he's quoting you, um, in keeping faith with our theological tradition, 
I believe that we need to call for the removal of the abstract of principles as the confessional statement of Southern and Southeastern. What if that script were flipped and South- Southwestern and New Orleans, both of their presidents signed the traditional statement? Why don't they just become the two schools that keep the flag flying for the Sandy Creek tradition? We'll just tell the Calvinist professors at those schools who can't sign the traditional statement that they'll have to find positions somewhere else. Of course, that's crazy talk. The simpler and more rational decision is to eliminate the abstracts the abstract, and open up Southern and Southeastern to robust articulation of traditionalism. I'm, I'm curious, since you said that, have you gotten any pushback or feedback from that statement? Because it makes perfect sense to me to say what you've said. Hey, we're wanting diversity. And, and Al Mohler is saying we want diversity. Diversity is so great. But then they've got schools where Calvinists become the leader of those schools, and they're re-implementing the statements like the abstract of principles as something that the professors have to sign in order to teach there, thus making the school monolithic sociologically. Address that and tell me, has anything come back to you from our Calvinistic brothers or anybody from the SBC with regard to that charge and that call? No, I'd say so far on that, it's it, from the Calvinist side, it's been crickets. <laughs> you know, now I've had a lot of conversations from non-Calvinists about it. <laughs> they're like, yeah, you know, what, what, what have you been thinking? But from the other side, I mean, nothing, nothing. Uh, well, they have to see the double so, standard. I mean, clearly they have to see the double well, standard. I, if if they can't, I'd like to see how they don't. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, to say, say you want diversity, but we're going to make the schools that we're in charge of non-diverse, monolithic, um, in, in, in their approach to sociological... And we're going to keep, you know, and heaven forbid, you know, hey, Southwestern becomes monolithic as far as traditionalism is concerned. They would scream, I would think, if if Paige Patterson uh, wouldn't allow for any, uh, you know, reformed thinkers, uh, Calvinistic reformed thinkers within Southwestern or New Orleans. If Chuck Kelly did that there or Paige Patterson did it at Southwestern, they wouldn't. Oh, my God. Wouldn't it be a revolt uh, of sorts? <laughs> oh, gosh. I could only yeah, imagine. Be, they, they go bananas. I, I, and that's and that to me was the most clear um, concept and understanding of that you you can't lead in neutral, um, and and that's that's one of the reasons I've appreciated what you've done so much is that you've take you took traditionalist, which is the majority view I, I think by any estimation, all the, all the LifeWay research, everything else, so over 60% of, of Southern Baptist pastors have expressed a concern about the rise of Calvinism. And it's less than 30% who actually identify as some form of Calvinist um, in, in the true Calvinistic sense. And, and therefore, it's, it's clear that the majority of the rank and file, as you put it, the, the, you know, the majority of Southern Baptist attendees and a part of the, the Southern Baptist Convention are not adherents to five-point Calvinism or even our moralism, four-point Calvinism. And therefore, it, it's kind of like you awaken the, the sleeping giant, so to speak, to, to draw people to the attention of, okay, we say we want diversity between these two streams. We, we say we want to be able to get along with these two streams, but one of those two streams is driving the schools to adopt a monolithic Calvinistic sociological worldview among its professors and are producing um, Calvinistic pastors, many of which, and I've experienced this in here in Texas as a denominational worker, churches who are getting Calvinistic pastors into churches that have been historically more traditional in their thinking sociologically and causing all kinds of havoc um, and and splits within the, the churches. Um, if this is not addressed if it, if you would continue to be silent on this issue and just think, okay, let's all just go along and get along, that's just going to continue, is it not? Right. That's why I that's why I wrote the traditional statement. That's why I gave the address I gave at the convention. It's, it it is a problem, hmm. and so if if you see a problem, then you probably ought to do something about it. The the fib we've all been telling ourselves is it isn't a problem. Oh, it'll be just fine. Well, it, it's not just fine. It's, it's kind of turned into a big mess, and so we need to do something about it. And we have uh, two of our seminaries, and frankly, I think the case can be made, our most popular seminaries right now 
are abstract seminaries, you know, and they are they're they, they're producing Calvinist pastors that mm-hmm. have to that, that want to pastor churches, and uh, just to do Southern Baptists want that? See, I don't think they don't. Not right now. I mean, I think the Southern Baptists, as they stand today, right. If they knew and really understood, oh, we have you know we have two of our seminaries that only um, r- really advocate one position, a, a, a pretty sternly Calvinistic uh, uh, position. But you know there are a couple of other seminaries that that advocate for both. Now, does that sound right to you? It definitely doesn't sound when, when, like as you pointed out, if, if at Southwestern or, or New Orleans the president said, you know what, we're going to bounce things out a little bit, and so uh, we've actually, um, you know, asked the Calvinist uh, professors to, you know, retire early and m- move on or find somewhere else to be, and we're just going to be exclusively, um, you know, non-Calvinistic seminaries. Now, when do you know? <laughs> I'm telling you, yeah, no, that would be that would be upheaval uh, to no end. I, I, I'm interested when Al Mohler, um I, I know you mentioned this in your presentation, when Al Mohler came into um, Southern, he explicitly said that he's re-implementing and bringing the, the, the school back to the abstracter principles, um, which obviously indicate it had kind of moved away from it to some degree, obviously. Um, and, and therefore, he's, he's trying to kind of get them back to like the founders movement is trying to do, trying to get us back to our roots as they want to put it. Um, right. And therefore, uh, you know, re-implement that. Did, did that cause some professors to have to leave because they were not people who held to the Calvinistic, you know, views of the abstract principles? No, no. And again, I, and I think I do this. I, I hope I did this well in, in, in my lectures. I have a, I have a great appreciation for Al Mohler. And, oh, sure. And yeah. That he's done absolutely. And I would say primarily in 93, he's because the abstract, uh, uh, because the Baptist faith in message 63, which wasn't, I don't think on its face, was weak on the, the nature of the authority of Scripture, but it just had some language that was being exploited by moderates to, to give them a way to wiggle out from underneath, you know, basically inerrancy. And so uh, the abstract was much stronger. Uh, on the issue of biblical authority, um, but that's that was not the major, what Al that was kind of the major issue of that day. Right? That was it. Yeah, yeah. They, they, the problem with those guys is they didn't believe the, believe the Bible was inerrant. <laughs> right. You know, it was a mess. It was a mess over there, and so Al uh, and I think you know, in a in a you know, he's why he's a good leader. He says, "Here's our confessional statement. Here it is." You know, and it, it needs to mean something. The, the abstract didn't mean anything at Southern in '93. It just yeah. mean, you know, it just meant whatever anybody thought it might mean. But it, to Al, it meant what the founders said it meant. <laughs> right. And he didn't, he didn't say, you know, oh, and I'm not really talking about the soteriology part over here. No, he's, we all knew no. Al was a five-point Calvinist. Right. You know? Um, so that, that's, that was, is what was really going on in 93, but I think at the same time, it would be Al's position that a, that a robust, doctrines of grace-driven kind of theology uh, rises the tide in, in, in every area of theology. So why wouldn't you want to just go great guns for the, you know, the, whole, right. the whole kit and caboodle of Calvinism? Right. Uh, it's just because, again, he believes it's better. Yeah. Um, well, and, and it seems like metals... really engaging him along those lines, we, we didn't. We were just thankful to have this really super smart, courageous, convictional guy that got, I, I'm talking about the abuse <laughs> yeah. was unbelievable. And he just stuck it out, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and, 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 and in, in many and most ways, Southern is, you know, kind of place any of us would be proud of. And I think it could be improved if it had a really robust expression of, of, of non-Calvinist soteriology there. Right. I, right. I talk to students who are at Southern who feel who are not Calvinist, who feel like there's a ham handed kind of treatment of their point of view. Right. They don't feel free to really raise their hand in class and say, well, you know, what about this or what about that? Now I I know the leadership at Southern would, would push back against that and I'm I'm giving anecdotes at this point. But but I'm I think it's Al's duty uh, uh at a Southern Baptist institution that's quite 
that's supported by a cooperative program to not just say, well, you know, non-Calvinism, you know, it's, it's better than a sharp stick in the eye. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, 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 I think it's important to say it's, it's important mm-hmm. and valuable. And uh, yes, it stands in tension with our point of view. And so far, after a couple hundred years, Baptists haven't been, been able to figure out how to resolve it. But we feel like both are really, really, really very necessary and important for mm-hmm. our, our identity. Amen. Uh, not, boy, that, that's a really good thing. Go to Southwestern if you want to hear about it. Yeah. yeah. That's a really good thing. Go to New Orleans if you want to hear about it. Well, well I, you know, we're coming up on our hour mark, and I promised you I'd, I'd, I'd uh, shut it down pretty quick to our hour mark because I know you've got other things you've got to get to today. And um, But I, I wanted to give you just one last opportunity to give a challenge to those who are listening um, if, if they're asking the question, okay, so what now? You know, what next is kind of the, the, the first question you asked at the beginning of your presentation. What, what, what's next for traditionalists? What do we need to be involved in? And um, a lot, uh, you know, people who listen to this don't necessarily, you know, a lot of pastors and seminary student, you know, past, you know professors listen to this as well. But, um, but especially those that may feel like I don't have a lot of say in the convention. I'm not a, a key leader in the convention or something of that nature. How can I help? What can I do? How can I get involved? Um, in other words, what's next for those who are listening? How would you encourage them with regard to our sociology and, and, and taking a stand um, with, with regard to what we believe about God's love for every man, woman, boy, and girl, and his desire for er- everyone to be saved and his well-meant offer? What are things we can do practically um, in, in, in our churches, in our homes, um, on social media and other places that can help you and to, to get behind what you've already done and began to do as far as leading the convention in the right direction. Yeah, I, I really gave three things in the lecture, and I can reel those off pretty quick. You know, one is, uh, one is uh, in the realm of theology. Uh, we need to be, get really good at saying what we believe and what we don't believe. Uh, I see among traditionalists too much, frankly, just just patent ignorance. They say ignorant things. They do mischaracterize Calvinism, and it just it it just feeds the stereotype that we're dumb. Right. Uh, read some books. Get get real clear. You got to practice it. And and my deal is you got to have lots of conversations. That's how I learn to 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 engage and get get the thoughts to crystallize in my mind. Uh, Get courageous. Have these conversations. Try it out. Don't don't let get, let yourself get intimidated because somebody memorized uh, you know sixteen high sounding words from the one John Piper book they read. That they're they put on their pants one leg at a time just like we do. So get in there. You know, have the talk. If you, if you get you know you get knocked on your heels a couple of times because you're not ready, learn from it. But I want to say to you, you can be theologically confident hmm. because there are uh, Calvinism really has some. To, to, to me, some problems that 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 are not solvable. Mm-hmm. So get confident, say so, uh, and then just be uh, you know be as uh, as generous as you can be in your attitude. But uh, in your churches, when when somebody's handing around the John Piper books or handing around the, you know whatever is to say, it has some good things in that. But but let's talk about the Calvinism that's in there. Uh, let, let's be you know let's be smart. Don't right. just believe something because of a certain personality says it. Then secondly, uh, I, I do think a confessional conversation. Um, uh, uh, I, 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 somebody's going to need to explain to me how the point I make about how the confessions function at our schools uh, is an salient point. Um, uh, I was curious, did that ever come up in the uh, the council that you were on? Was that ever discussed no. back then? Okay. Nope. Yeah. Because I really think that's 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 a practical thing that could be done to remove the abstract of principles that could actually help with the diversity issues that we're talking about. If 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 in other I words, put your money where your mouth is, uh, Al Mohler and yeah. others, and say if you really want diversity, if you really think that it's the it's the good balance to have us um, traditionalists a part of the convention and pushing on you, if you really believe that then take out the abstract of principles. Let's all rely upon the Baptist faith and message, um, it, even though it's a flawed document in and of itself, but at least it's it's broad enough and a big enough of a tent to include all of us within it so that we can have true diversity uh, within our schools. Right, and so so from there I would say pol- the 
political engagement. This means going to the convention. I, I think we're going to need to hear an answer on, on the issue of abstract, for instance. Yeah. Uh, if you're not going to remove it, then you really need to explain the convention why. Right. Because uh, I, I don't see the reasons for it. Yeah. Um, uh, and if so, great. Well, let's just go ahead and let's get let's get rid of the Baptist faith and message and just have the abstract of principles. Or do we need to go ahead and institute it at uh, Midwestern and Southwestern and, and New Orleans and Golden Gate? Right. You know, right. you can't have your cake and eat, or you can't have it both ways. Right. You you know, if it's that great, you know, then it's what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Uh, uh, or if the thing is, well, we're just going to have Charleston schools and Sandy Creek schools. I don't think Southern Baptists know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't think they Explain think it to them. that's yeah. what they're paying for. Right. Um, uh, and so if that's the deal, then we need to say that's what we want. Yeah. And if we don't want that, then we need to say that actually is not what we want uh, at the schools. So, so it, we need to we need to sort of sort of start talking to each other, and we need to start asking our you know. You know, maybe making contact with the with the uh, board members from our states that uh, they're are represented on boards and letting them know that you know I you know just you're gonna have to you know make some phone calls and and again don't be mean right um, but but be uh, you know be inquisitive. It seems to me, and you, I think you made this this connection that you can almost follow the example of the founders um, and and what they were doing over the last twenty. 30 years uh, as the loyal opposition, so to speak, but they, they were working to push Calvinism within all of these different institutional organizations, and they've been fairly successful. If we followed their same model um, as a Connect 316 group and as advocates of traditionalism, then we might be doing pretty well at least to, to reinstitute true diversity within the schools, if nothing else. Yeah, I think that's right, and I think that's the nature of Kind of lead all the way back to the beginning of our conversation. That's the nature of theological debate. Right. It's it's a debate. So engage it. The, the founders guys didn't didn't do this because they didn't have anything better to do. They they had a point of view that they thought was very very important, and they got after it. Hmm. And that's what you do. I mean, if, if these beliefs matter. Right. And so, but again, you we can't say that founders' beliefs matter enough to kind of fight about it. But our beliefs don't matter. So we right. shouldn't fight about it. Right. No, <laughs> again, you can't have it both ways. Yeah. Uh, so, so you know, we we can't sit idly by uh, while another point of view is is, is advocated and, and promoted, and then we're told, well, you know, you, you just need to make sure that both positions are being advocated. Well, that's right. not fair. Yeah. yeah, it's not what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Dr. Hankins, thank you so much for your time. Um, there's a dozen other questions running through my mind, and and I and I'll hopefully get you back on again in the future because I know sure. we'll want to yeah. talk some yeah, more. But to. but um but thank you so much for your leadership, and I know you've become a target uh, to, <laughs> to so many uh, critiques, and uh, and and I know you have other things you would rather be focused on. But I do appreciate your leadership and. Uh, in the way in which you've engaged this discussion and uh, in leadership within the Southern Baptist Convention to really even be aware that the issue was even there. Um, and so it's been men like you and, and Dr. Patrick and others uh, with Connect 316 and and, uh, and and some of the other organizations that have cited uh, some of the seminaries and, and seminary leaders that have cited with traditionalists and, and signed on with you on that statement that have really started to move the pendulum back the other direction, I think that we're going to begin to see people begin to recognize this is happening and, uh, and to begin to take a, a stand in the right direction, to have that loyal opposition, as you put it. So thank you again for yep. your work, brother. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you for giving me some time. Blessings to you. We'll talk to you next time. Goodbye. Great. Bye.